I'm here to help. I mean, we can't afford to lose the entire generation, right? The, pre the pre 79 generation. Now, I voted against funding for Pakistan because I thought. They are not acting the way that we would in America. Number one, and you don't take American money and oppress your people with our money. That's, That's not it. what we stand for. <laughs> so I tell Tom, you know, I voted against funding. And he said, these people are going to like you. You yeah. should come, and you're going to like them. And regardless of where the threats come from, this is America. I don't care where they come from in America outside of America or in America, we don't run from anybody. We don't run from anybody. That's what we know and that's what we live by. In America, we don't care what your skin color is. We don't care what sex you are. We don't care if you're tall, short. We care about what's in here and everybody is treated the same. And that's the beacon that we want to show the rest of the world and lead. So I want to commend you for the gathering tonight, uh, this evening, and I want to commend you for your strong stand. If you don't do it, if you don't do it, who will? And it's the beginning. These things have a way of beginning somewhere. And this might be the day that marks, you know, the voice of Karachi might be the, the this might be the day that marks the beginning of a great movement that changes the world. There's hundreds and hundreds of people on the street demanding self-rule and end to Pakistan's colonial rule in Gilgit Baltistan and end to China's encroachment on our land and resources. And because of Pakistan's um, um, relationship with uh, the militant organizations and its uh, illegal involvement in Afghanistan, uh, Gilgit Baltistan became the hotbed for militancy during the Afghan Jihad. And it's been going on and continued like that since then. And unfortunately, that has, as a consequence, resulted in massacre of the local people there. The Pakistani government has already handed over the strategically important Gwadar port in Balochistan to China. The people of Balochistan are treated as colonized people with no regard to their fundamental rights. Since 2001, thousands of political activists have been in force disappeared in Balochistan. Most of the time, the dead bodies are being throne and the wilderness. The United States and Pakistan have a long history uh, and a good historical relationship. Uh, however, uh, the oppression of, of, of ethnic minorities to include Muhajir, etc., has existed for a long time. So if we can take uh, the unpleasantness that, that's occurred and, and have something good from, come from it, uh, it's advocating on behalf of individuals to have equality regardless of their ethnicity, etc. Um, and so I won't conjecture as to why it's failed. I would submit, though, that if you look at the Constitution and you compare it to how the actual government is functioning, if you look at where the reins of power are, if you look at uh, some, some abilities of the ISI in particular to affect uh, what, what some might call control, I think that's beyond what was contemplated. Um, so I, what I want to be clear about is, again, there's no single community of human beings in Pakistan who I'm being critical of. It is the leadership of the nation that denies individuals the rights that they are entitled to, not again by a constitution or by law, but by nature. Now, I am not standing here advocating any sort of armed intervention anywhere in the world, but I am saying this. If the American people and the American government will not stand up and speak for those who have no voice, who will? It is natural that Balosh should stand up for Balosh, that Punjabis might stand up for Punjabis, that Sindhi might stand up for Sindhi, these things that Muhajirs might stand up for Muhajirs. But our greatest selves will arrive when people stand up for people. And so I want to be very clear. I don't know which camera to look at. I want to be very clear to my friends in the Pakistani government. As long as I have a voice in this body, I will advocate on behalf of doing business with those nations and entities who treat their ethnic and religious minorities just as any other group. We will not, so long as we are on this earth, live in a perfect world. Tragically, human beings are fallen. But when there is systematic and institutionalized discrimination that separates individuals based on how they look or how they worship or how they speak, etc., 
and the United States stands by and turns a blind eye, then we betray the very essence of the idea that we aspire to arrive at. With every tool that we have in the toolbox, whether it's sanctions, whether it's the implication of global Magnitsky concepts on leaders who oppress their people, whether in Pakistan or anywhere, I will advocate on behalf of that. Religious seminaries were set up by Pakistani military agencies, the ISI. Thousands of religious seminaries were created throughout Pashtun areas and people were radicalized. And there you have the emergence of Taliban. It is interesting that the agencies that created hundreds of thousands of Pashtun Taliban were not Pashtun themselves. They were all Punjabi speaking that actually formed the majority of the Pakistan army. I would say over 90% people come from only one province. Tens of thousands of ethnic Bengalis who actually had supported the idea of Pakistan's creation, who were a majority ethnic group in Pakistan. Pakistan, when it was created, was like one Pakistan here. In the middle, you had India. And then you had the other part, East Pakistan, which was dominated by Bengalis. And that gives you the idea how uh, much time our British friends spend on carving out India and Pakistan, how much thought process went into that you have Pakistan here and there, and in between you have a huge India. Bengalis were 54 percent. And what happened with them? They were marginalized the same way Balochis, Gilgit Baldistani, Hazara, Muhajirs are being marginalized. The majority demanded their rights, and Punjabi minority declared the majority as traitors of Pakistan. Imagine minorities declaring the majority a traitor. 250,000 um, Bengali women were raped. It is all documented by the United Nations. We are also witnessing relentless killing of ethnic and religious minorities in Pakistan at the hands of the country's security forces that come from only one province. The list just goes on and on. As an American Mohajir or Mohajir American, I believe that silence was silence over these mindless massacres, ethnic cleansing, and genocide is as wrong today as it was in the past. The United States is not just a country. It is a beacon for freedom, human rights, and liberty. It must not allow any force in the world whether it's Pakistani military or any other military, to carry out crimes against humanity. Some people argue that Pakistan is a nuclear arm. There is only so much pressure that can be applied. I say to those people, Pakistan will never have more nuclear weapons in the next 50 or even 100 years that the Soviet Union had at the time of its collapse. Nuclears, nuclear weapons cannot save a country especially when half, nearly half the population of that country is facing genocide and massacres. The U.S. needs to support democratic and secular forces in Pakistan and deal very firmly with Pakistan's jihad-obsessed military establishment. This is an army that claims to have the best intelligence agencies in the world, but fails to find the world's most wanted man, Osama bin Laden, just a few hundred yards from its elite military academy in a heavily guarded garrison city. But Pakistan's military establishment does not deserve even a dime of the US taxpayers' money. I commend President Trump, his administration, for finally holding Pakistani military establishment accountable for its treachery. And we fully support his efforts to make South Asia a peaceful and a stable region. Mm -hmm.